You're watching Euronews tonight. I'm Rome Zaidi, and these are the headlines this hour. Russia must withdraw its forces from the sovereign territory of Ukraine. Russia must stop destabilizing the international security situation. Ukraine tells the UN that it needs action now to stop Russia from moving further into its territory as it prepares to implement a state of emergency. As the EU formally adopts its package of sanctions against Russia, targeting individuals and all lawmakers who voted to recognize breakaway regions, the bloc calls Putin's actions against Ukraine illegal and unacceptable. President Putin says he is still open to dialogue, but that Russia's security concerns are non-negotiable. And here in the Cube, we look at the ongoing cyber warfare and how this crisis is being displayed across borders. Good evening. Ukraine is set to declare a state of emergency following Moscow's approval of two breakaway regions, as well as its movement of forces onto Ukrainian soil. The measures will see the introduction of stronger security at critical infrastructure facilities and military checkpoints along key transport links. Unmarked military vehicles have been spotted crossing the border after the Kremlin officially recognized the independence of the Luhansk and Donetsk regions on Monday. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says Kiev of standoff with Russia will decide the future of European security. Its foreign affairs minister addressing an emergency UN General Assembly session said Kiev needs action now. Russia must withdraw its forces from the sovereign territory of Ukraine. Russia must stop destabilizing the international security situation. We Ukrainians want peace and we want to resolve all issues through diplomacy. We stand ready for all possible scenarios and ready to protect our land and our people if Russia further attacks. The U.S. says NATO, um, the U.S. and NATO say Russia continues to stage a massive invasion force on Ukraine's border. Since the end of last year, security analysts estimate over 100,000 Russian troops have been sent to the region. On January 25th, Russia began joint military drills with Belarus. Those troops were set to leave last weekend, but Belarusian officials said the soldiers would stay indefinitely due to escalating tensions in Ukraine. Moscow denies its planning an invasion. Well, now our correspondent in Kiev, Sasha Vakulina, joins us now. Sasha, good to see you. So a 30-day state of emergency, reservists being called up the army. Ukraine is readying itself for the worst-case scenario? Well, definitely it feels like that. And in addition to those 36,000 of the reservists, today we've got some new lines with additional 5,000 troops to be called by the National Guard and extra 5,000 more troops to the Border Guard Service. So this is not yet the general mobilization, but yet these are the measures announced today. Also, Ukrainian Parliament today voted to approve in the first reading the draft law that would allow, that would give the permission to Ukrainians to carry firearms and act in self-defense. These are some of the measures announced today in Kyiv by Ukrainian officials. They have also called on for all the Ukrainians who are currently in Russia to come back immediately and for those who are now not there not to travel to Russia. Now, Sasha, we're also seeing reports of another cyber attack, this latest one hitting uh, government websites. What more can you tell us about that? Indeed, according to the latest information, it has started this afternoon around 4 p.m. and it, the cyber attack crashed the websites of the Cabinet of Ministers, the Security Service, the Verkhovna Rada, this is the Ukrainian Parliament, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and a few banks. The, it's still on, the investigation has started. They're trying to look into it to find more information about the sources. Where is it coming from? And of course, the, the attack today comes just seven days after the attack that was called already the biggest and the, the largest in Ukraine's history, Mariam. And Sasha, what's the mood like in the capital? Are people resigned to the possibility of a full-scale invasion? I would say that the mood here about the possible invasion is getting more and more worrying every day. These are the conversations that you can hear just walking down the streets of Kiev and other cities in Ukraine. What the Ukrainians do try to do nowadays, they try to be resilient and they try to be as consolidated as possible. And uh, on that one today, one of the charities in the country, the fund called 
come back alive announced that just over one day over 24 hours ukrainians donated more for ukrainian army than they did in the whole 2021 there was more than 600 thousand euros in donations in just 24 hours by the population of Ukraine for the army. Okay, Sasha, thank you so much for that update from Kiev. Thank you so much. As tensions build following Russia's movement of troops, President Putin marked a national day of celebration. He attended a wreath-laying ceremony on the annual Defender of the Fatherland Day. But as the Kremlin was hit with a fresh wave of sanctions from the UK and US, Putin reaffirmed that Russia's interests remained non-negotiable. And during a call with Turkey's president, he doubled down on his rhetoric, accusing Ukraine of breaking the Minsk agreement. Nevertheless, Despite increasing uncertainty, the Kremlin insists it is still prepared for frank discussions with the West. Our country is always open to a direct and honest dialogue and ready to search for diplomatic solutions to the most complicated issues. But I want to repeat that Russia's interests and the security of our people are an indisputable priority. So we will continue to strengthen and modernize our army and navy, striving to increase their effectiveness so they are fitted out with the most cutting-edge equipment. Kalina Polanskaya joins us now from Rostov and Don on Russia's border with eastern Ukraine. Uh, Glina, always good to see you. So President Putin says that Russia is still open to dialogue, but his actions on Monday with the breakaway states and the movement of troops, it appears to say otherwise. Good evening. Well, it was the address of Vladimir Putin to the nation. Uh, it was uh, a celebration in Russia, the day of the defense of the fatherhood. So the message is not about the dialogue, I guess it's the dialogue on Russia's conditions and mostly about the defending of the fatherland. That's the message to the nation and uh, to the West. But what we see in reality is that uh, uh, the meeting between uh, Antony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, is cancelled. He cancelled it. He was supposed to meet with the, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov tomorrow. They were supposed to discuss a potential meeting between presidents of uh, presidents of Russia and uh, the United States, which is not on the table anymore. There is no dialogue. Russia is withdrawing uh, its uh, diplomats from uh, all of its missions in Ukraine. And we've heard that uh, Vladimir Putin spoke with uh, President Erdogan, and uh, President Erdogan said that uh, Turkey will not tolerate any moves against uh, against Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and Vladimir Putin said that what he did it was because uh, of uh, because of Ukrainian aggression in Donbass so uh, the uh, the strategy is very very clear now and I don't see any options for the dialogue with the West at this particular moment. Now Galina you've been speaking to locals on the ground and they seem to support uh, Putin's actions so what have they been telling you? Well, yes, I went to a town which is located on the border with the Lugansk uh, self-proclaimed separatist republic. The name of the town is Donetsk, but it's the Russian town. And uh, I spoke with the citizens who helped a lot, those evacuees who were going through the border point. They fed them and they helped them go in uh, uh, and find a shelter. So um, I asked all of those people what they thought about uh, the decision of Vladimir Putin to recognize those republics. And I was surprised that no one even doubts uh, this decision. Everyone thinks that it's good. Let's take a listen of some of their answers. We don't know what's going to happen, whether we will stay alive or not. So we don't want war. We don't need war. I think that Putin made the right decision, that now people will be protected. I don't think there will be a war like right now with the endless shelling. These poor people, they've been experiencing this for eight years. There was a recent uh, uh, poll released by the state post, the Russian state post of Tsuom, which says that actually 73% of Russians support the decision of Vladimir Putin and only 16% said that they don't agree. Galina Polanskaya, thank you so much for that update uh, on the um, Russian side of things. Thank you so much.
Now, the European Union has approved its package of sanctions against Russia following President Putin's recognition of the two breakaway states in eastern Ukraine. In London, Prime Minister Boris Johnson had to defend the sanctions of his government, has approved with accusations that they don't go far enough. Now, the EU's measures will target banks financing Russia's military and hundreds of individuals, including high-profile people within President Putin's circle. Well, for more on EU restrictions, we're now joined by Shona Murray, who's live for us in Brussels. Uh, so, Shona, the EU's measures that they've now signed off on, they're targeting some pretty high-level individuals within Putin's uh, inner circle. Tell us more. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they were formally agreed today, as we mentioned there, over 300 uh, members of the Russian state Duma, uh, Russian banks and so on. But remember, this is the first level of sanctions that relates to the Russian recognition of breakaway states. Tomorrow night, there is an emergency summit of EU leaders. All 27 member, st member states will be represented to discuss essentially what's next if and when there is further invasion of Ukraine. I'm joined now by Bruno Lette, who's an expert, a security expert with the German Marshall Fund. Um, Bruno, these sanctions are the first round. Do you think they'll make any impact? Uh, and what happens after that? Well, we clearly see that the sanctions today are you know, much more significant, for instance, what was on the table in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea. So the sanctions that we see now aim at three specific things. First of all, it's about preventing anyone to do business with the self-proclaimed republics of Luhansk and Donetsk and effectively isolating this territory economically. That's one. Number two, we see that Russian banks are being targeted, uh, those banks that help to refinance Russian sovereign debt. That might make it harder for Russia to finance a, a, a war campaign, basically. And third, we see that a series of individuals around Putin have been targeted with asset freezes and travel bans. Now, uh, this is significant, but these are not yet the sanctions that will cripple Russia economically. We see that the West has adopted a gradual approach, keeping options in reserve in case Putin decides to further escalate. And what happens next if he does? I mean, we know that there's a bit of concern over whether the unity that we've seen so far can be maintained, particularly when these sanctions hit specific countries. Yeah. Well, it's quite obvious that, you know, if Putin escalates, that the West also will need to escalate its own sanctions. Uh, so the measures will have to be harsher. And the harsher the measures towards Russia are, we also need to be prepared in Europe or in the West to take our own costs. Uh, the problem here is that will Europe remain united? So far, the EU has remained united on, on this. But if things get really serious, you know, we know that there are some member states that have some concerns when it comes to uh, energy supplies or capital markets. So this is really the one million dollar question. When things get really serious, will the EU remain united? And what can we expect or hope for in terms of uh, Vladimir Putin's reaction to these sanctions? in terms of them being a deterrent? Well, we see that, you know, Russia has probably been prepared for some of these sanctions. We also know that Russia is prepared to take a cost for its own behavior. Um, right now, an important element is also to know that Russia's national sovereign wealth fund is at record high, estimated at roughly $171 uh, billion. So Russia has also effectively created a financial cushion, if I may say so, a war chest with which it could buy the time. So really, you know, the question is, will the current sanctions be enough to, to, to change the Russia's behavior, knowing that Russia is willing to take a cost? That is the question. OK, Bruno Lette, thank you very much for joining us. And back to studio. All right, Shana, thank you so much. That analysis on those EU sanctions, thanks so much. All right, well, we will take a short break, but still to come, more analysis on the deepening crisis in Ukraine. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Euronews tonight. Now, sanctions, widespread condemnation and a unified response are what greeted Russia's movement of troops into eastern Ukraine and its recognition of the two breakaway separatist regions. But President Putin is standing firm in the face of this. Well, to discuss what is ahead, we're now joined by Linos Linkavichus, former Minister of Foreign Affairs and of Defence of Lithuania. Um, Mr Linkavages, thank you so much for joining us um, on the programme tonight. Now, you've been really critical of President Putin's insistence that he's open to dialogue. Do you agree with the UK and the US when they say that Putin's move are the start of a Ukrainian invasion? If you would ask Ukrainians, they would tell you that the war started eight years ago. 
and nothing special is happening now, basically. But what, what he did here a couple of days ago from this historic speech of Putin, he outlined his vision uh, and also his ambition, what he's go going to do. And uh, also we should uh, draw some conclusions that uh, our efforts to stop him so far, they failed. So now it's very important to be united, uh, to make the strong, so to say, pressure. And that was a very important step uh, done by the European Union. And it's uh, very important that it was a fast decision, united, also coordinated with the United States, UK, Canada and other players. But uh, it remains to be seen whether it's uh, sufficient. Now, um, Mr. Lenkiewicz, um, President Putin has been quite dismissive of Ukraine's uh, sovereignty. President Zelensky says that the future of European security will be decided in what is unfolding. This is a critical time for Ukraine, but also for surrounding countries. Indeed, but not just for all the countries. I believe it's important uh, also the challenge for all international community. For European Union, for NATO, we're declaring some values. We're always saying that we're defending these values, and uh, all our it's our foundation of our uh, existence, basically. But we have to defend values where they are attacked, and when they are attacked, and uh, uh, to defend uh, the choice, uh, free free choice for sovereign countries to uh, to free, to choose the uh, the uh, arrangements of their statehood is not just uh, their business; it's also our concern. And that's very important, therefore, to show solidarity, but not only by words, statements, but also to make sure that this country has a right to exist, has a right to be sovereign, and has, has a right to make a choice. Do you think that President Putin has been surprised by the unified response that we are now seeing? I'm afraid he was not su surprised. Uh, uh, what is most important, that sanctions so far, if you were following what they are talking over the state control media, they are making fun of the sanctions. And I believe even now he believes that uh, this price is agreeable and uh, it will not stop him. He probably believes that these sanctions will not be sufficient as usually and will not uh, be targeted to his uh, cronies, to the close, close surrounding, which was the case so far. It's just starting, starting, starting to, to, to happen. And uh, by European Union or by UK, uh, getting rid of these golden visas, for instance, or your American sanctions targeting this very close uh, oligarchs, which are supporting uh, Putin personally and all Kremlin policy. That's exactly something which will give some hope, maybe will be some corrections. But it could be also not the case. But the UK, I mean, uh, they've been criticised for their sanction sanctions package. Do you think it's gone far enough? Uh, as I said, uh, a lot of space for improvement because we are talking for a long time. You know, this is also the strange uh, nickname that London Grad uh, appeared not for out of the blue. It's because uh, many, many oligarchs and dirty money and uh, real estate, uh, finding property in that capital, also in some other capitals. So, so far they felt immune and this is really time to change. Well, you bring up, you know, time to change. Do you think that there is a case for greater integration of Ukraine into both the EU and NATO? Or is that just feeding no. into what, what, what Putin calls Russia's security concerns? First of all, uh, we should understand that when Putin talked, he said how he respects Ukraine, uh, right? And uh, definitely his task to make sure that Ukraine is failed state and the only future uh, is just in partnering and friendship with Russia. Uh, <coughs> the future is not possible. So our task to make sure that this is wrong. And that means we have to provide assistance as much as possible in security field, in economy, and also providing clear European perspective for that country. I'm not talking about membership tomorrow, but at least I'm talking about a possibility for them to have this choice, which is uh, a lot of skepticism before, let's be frank, on this uh, among some of our allies. And just the moment of true now, we have really to defend the right of that country to make free choice and to be a member of European family. Mr. Linkavages, we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you so much for your analysis on your news tonight. Thank you so much. Well, we are now going to take a short break, but still to come, we're heading over to Matthew in the Cube. Marianne, we're continuing our coverage by looking at the online warfare of propaganda and cyber attacks. More on that after the break. 
Soldiers, sanctions, and now a state of emergency. The ongoing crisis in Ukraine has been described as Europe's most dangerous since the Second World War. But how is the situation being seen online in both Russia and the rest of Europe? Well, Matthew in the Cube has been following that story. Matthew? Indeed, Mariam. Tensions are heightened between Moscow, Kiev and the West, not just on the ground, but also online in a warfare of disinformation campaigns and cyber attacks. As you heard from Euronews correspondent Sasha Vakalina, Ukraine says it has once again been hit by a cyber attack affecting many of its ministries and two of the country's largest banks. They say this is similar to previous cyber attacks when Kiev has pointed the finger of blame at Russia. Now, the European Union has offered support to Ukraine to combat these kind of threats. But as the bloc tries to unite in its stance, in Eastern Europe, disinformation campaigns against the West are still making inroads. And it's by analysing the online conversation that you can really see the differences. For example, this is Google Trends. And if you go online around the world and search for either Russia or Ukraine, these are some of the most popular search terms. Why is Russia invading Ukraine? Why does Russia want to invade Ukraine? Why does Russia want Ukraine? Many of these portraying Moscow as the aggressor. But contrast that to Yandex, a Russian language search engine based in Moscow. There, if you search for Ukraine, you have very different search terms. Here, suggesting the former Ukraine, suggesting that it is Kiev who is invading and speaking about the so-called Ukrainian truth. Very different search terms and a very different side of the story that is being portrayed. But that's not the case for everyone on the east of Ukraine. For example, this is a hashtag that has also been trending in Russia on Twitter. It literally translates as the war with Ukraine. And online, many younger Russian users have been sharing this hashtag to voice their condemnation of the Kremlin, accusing President Vladimir Putin of scaremongering and warmongering, and saying that the situation is, in their words, frightening. So, Mariam, we have seen sanctions and, as you said, a state of emergency, but also, as you can see online, a very divisive war of propaganda at the same time as well. It really does look divisive, Matthew. Thank you for that. OK, well, we've reached the end of the programme, but we will leave you with a no comment from Milan, where the Olympic flag arrived ahead of the city's hosting of the Winter Games in 2026. Thanks for watching Euronews tonight.